I'm ready to go. Go right ahead, Hirsch. Okay, so the first thing, just to make sure, is um, I am Hirsch von Henford. I am the person who's going to be teaching the class. Um, this is the third lesson out of six. Um, and so if you missed the first two, don't worry. They're actually online and, and available uh, from the Herald's website and also on the Kingdom YouTube site and so on. Um, so anyway, um, just to give you a quick background, I have been in the 45 plus years I've been doing the SCA. I've been a Herald for a good portion of that time. And while I am not the most expert herald on doing a work, doing armory and so on. I've been doing it for quite a while. And so I've got a pretty good feel for a lot of it. So anyway, so we're going to be jumping in to the third lesson today. So just a couple of general reminders. Um, these are aimed at SCA heraldry for both heralds and non-heralds. Um, and now I, I wasn't sure if somebody might you know, find the link out there somewhere and decide to grab it and, and go with it. Uh, which is why I have this note about if you're not part of the SCA, that's okay. You can still, you know, be part of the class. Um, now, one important aspect is I'm going to be attempting to be fairly thorough on the subjects that I'm covering, which is why this is spread out over six classes. I can try to cram it down into a smaller number of classes, but then I couldn't give you as much detail. Okay. Now, um, the important thing is even with everything I'm trying to present, I can't possibly give you every single permutation and every single creature and every single possible charge and so on. There's just too much. But I'm going to give you a good feel for what's out there. And I'm not expecting anybody to memorize all the information that I'm throwing at you. There's going to be a lot. Um, I don't have it all memorized. I'm constantly going out to the web or pulling a book off the shelf or whatever to look something up because it's just impossible to keep it all in your head. There's just way too much information there. So, okay, so basic rules, microphones off. Um, Sarah will keep be keeping an eye on chat mode if I don't catch something, although Zoom has been pretty good about, about putting it right there in my face. So, um, but um, if you have a question, use chat mode. Um, um, but I would rather that you try to keep most questions to the end, but if it's something that you just have to say, have to ask a question about, um, use the chat mode for it. Um, but it is important. Questions, I've been a teacher for many years. Questions are important to understanding. Um, if I say something and it doesn't make sense, it's because that's how it works in my head. Um, and that may not be the way it works in your head. So um, it's very important that you ask those questions because if you have a question, somebody else probably has the same question. Okay. So, lesson goals. So today we're going to be looking at charges. And the last lesson we were working with charges. We looked at ordinaries and, and, and subordinaries. This lesson we're going to be looking at humans and beasts. And by beasts, I'll get into more detail. Um, but basically, they're mostly land-based. We'll be looking at other creatures in the next lesson, birds, fish, and you know, reptiles, that kind of thing. But that's going to be in the next lesson. Um, we'll be discussing postures, the tincture called proper, head positions, and parts. And when we talk about parts, we're talking, you know, the, the forelimb of a lion you know, and things like that. Um, so lots of things to think about. So when you're looking at humans and beasts both, and this goes into other, when we get into um, monsters and, and other charges and so on, is the posture of the creature the head position, and that's important because there's a default head position for most creatures, whether it's humans or, you know, four-legged beasts or whatever. The default is that the head is facing the same direction as the body is facing. Okay, and we'll see that with a bunch of the images I'll show you. Um, and then there's also some attributes, uh, specific lines, there's colors, specific aspects that change the appearance. And so we'll take a look at all of that. And then there's the body parts. So when we look at body parts, and again, we'll talk, we'll look at these individually, but um, it's possible to use various parts of different creatures, heads, antlers, legs, arms, hands, tail, and half of a creature. You can use the top or front half of a creature. 
Unfortunately, I realized as I was looking at things just before the class started, I may not have given any actual examples of a demi lion, but or or anything, but we'll take a look. So now, as we talked about in the first lesson, the the term blazon is actually the description, the words that describe the pictures. Okay. Um, and so there are blazon terms for all of these things, okay? But there are also some creatures that have their own terms for the exact same postures, which is kind of an interesting aspect because heraldry, while mostly consistent, has its own little inconsistencies all the way through, okay? So, and of course, because of the large number of creatures and options, we're only going to look at some of them, but I'm going to look at a fairly good example of what's possible. So when we're looking at colors and tinctures and then postures, um, all of the charges used in heraldry can use the various tinctures. Okay, and this is an important aspect a lot of people don't realize. Um, this includes furs, it includes, um, uh, the, you can do field divisions on a charge. So you can take a lion, just the lion itself, and make the lion per pale and use two different colors for that same lion, okay? So there's a lot of different cool things that can be done here. Um, there are also what is called proper, which are default tinctures for some creatures and for some items. Not all creatures have a, have a proper coloration and not all items when we get to inanimate charges and so on have a proper um, coloration. But it, proper is useful and we'll talk about that. It's a little tricky because it's hard to pin down every single proper. If you look at bears, for example, what is a bear proper? There's brown bears, there's black bears, there's polar bears, there's ice bears. For if you're from anywhere around a glacier in Alaska, and you might know something about ice bears, or gray bears, um, and so on. So there's lots of different types of bears, and they all have their own colors. And so there is no single proper that you can define for a bear. However, there are creatures that there are specific definitions that are pretty consistent, okay? Um, proper is important because it can also be sometimes used to get around the rule of tincture. So, for example, a person up in Alicia, as a matter of fact, um, who is registering some penguins is getting away with putting penguins on a red field because penguins are half black and half white. And because of that, she can get away with it. Otherwise, it would be a problem with the rule of tincture. Okay, you can't normally put something that's mostly black, for example, on a red field. Okay, and so this allows her to get around the rule of tincture and have her penguins on, on, a, on a red field. So that's kind of a cool little thing that you can do. Now, many charges have what is called a default position or posture. So, for example, if I tell you, uh, so if you read a blazon that says a lion, and it doesn't give you a position for the lion, then you know that the lion is going to be rampant, which is the standard fighting posture for most animals, okay? So that's the default posture for a lion. So we'll, and we'll talk about some of them. I, I, won't, I don't think I have all the defaults written down and I'm gonna point you where you can find them if you want them. So the SCA College of Arms defines all of these. Um, the most important aspect of things like um, a lion, without having to state a lion rampant, is that the, when you define the blazon, the actual words to describe the armory, it's nice to keep them as short as possible. So if you don't have to stick the word rampant in there, it's kind of nice. Um, and the same thing for um, colors like proper for a fox. I use that as an example. A fox rampant proper is mostly red. It has black socks and a white chest and the tip of the tail. Rather than trying to actually put into the blazon a fox rampant ghoul's feet, sable, chest, and tip of the tail argent, you can say a fox rampant proper. And that shortens the blazon by a huge amount. And anybody that knows enough about heraldry would know a fox is ghoul's by and feet or sable and so on. And you don't have to worry about putting all that into the blazon. So heralds like to try to keep the blazon short unless there's no way around it. Okay, sometimes there's just no way you have to put a lot of detail. In it. So anyway, so now we're going to get into the actual charges. And we're going to start with humans. And we're starting with humans because it's, it's the smaller category. Okay, human figures are not used a lot in heraldry. They are used, 
Um, but human parts are actually used a lot more than the actual full figure of a human. Okay. Um, so now, um, Fox Davies, one of our primary sources that we use for a lot of this, uh, doesn't actually provide a lot of examples. So I ended up going out to Bruce Strachanarius' website and grabbed a bunch of stuff. Um, he also talks about this a bit. He talks about humans proper. One of the problems with human proper, you've got people who are very dark skinned. You've got people who are kind of in the middle. You've got, you know, people like me who are very white um, and so on. Um, and so trying to define proper. And so basically the College of Arms decided to, uh, basically you have uh, dark skinned, brown skinned, or light skinned for the defaults for the different you know, for Caucasian versus, you know, um, other, other terms that can be used. Okay. And it just makes it a little easier um, if you decide to use proper. A lot of people with, with human figures don't tend to use proper, but they can. Um, Bruce also notes that the hair tincture, if you're using, you know, humans need to be, needs to be specifically defined. And there's a blazing term called crind for, for hair. It's kind of an interesting term. I, it's like, I haven't actually tried to hunt that one down, but anyway. Now, um, he also notes that human figures are assumed to be wearing clothes, okay? That's the term vested. Um, if you uh, define a human as, as with, that's wearing clothes, you would then want to define the color of the clothes as well as the color of the skin and the color of the hair. So humans can be a little interesting on that aspect. But also keep in mind that nudes were not uncommon in period heraldry. And the reason that I mention that is that um, the, the human mindset, the modern mindset about nudity is very different from that of the period mindset about nudity, okay? And so it wasn't a big deal to a lot of people at period, you know? These days, because of, especially in America with our Puritan background and all that, whatever your religious beliefs happen to be, of the American Puritan background, um, nudity is kind of like, oh my God, they put a nude something on this. You know, it's like, whatever, you know. So there you go. Okay, so anyway, so most of my pictures of humans are from Bruce Draconarius's website. And again, the resources page at the end of the slides will have links to all of that. If you pull down the slides, you can, or, or the PowerPoint presentation, all of that will be on the resources page. Um, but um, that's because Fox Davies doesn't have a lot of pictures of humans. And actually, I don't think he has any, um, except for maybe some angels. But anyway, um, so first off, there's a maiden. And I do note that um, a maiden, a nude maiden may be in her modesty, that's a blazon term, if she's covering her breast with her arm. That's actually, a, you actually do see that periodically. You'll see a, a maiden in her modesty. So, yeah. Um, so I'm also showing the arms of Finna who recently left the kingdom, but she was a, she's a former Baroness of Rivenoak, um, where she actually has um, a full figured nude female as shown. And this is her preferred uh, rendition of her arms. Um, note the way that her hair covers up the nether regions you know, and all of that. That's just a way of dealing with it. Um, some people would be more blatant about it, whatever. Um, so you have a Moor, a Saracen, a savage or savage, which I thought was always fun. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, a wild man or woodhouse, which is an interesting term, but a wild man is basically um, covered entirely in hair or leaves, you know, whatever. Um, and then on the far right um, is a demi pilgrim. And so this is where we come into the term demi. You're basically using the top half of the human in this case. Um, and that allows you to do something that's a little different. Um, you don't have to worry about his legs, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and this is from the SCA arms of Garrett de Granada. Um, and you'll see that there, it's uh, a demi, let's see, let me move this a little bit. A demi pilgrim conterney, and we'll talk about the term conterney in more detail later, is facing the other way. Um, proper, and so proper in this case, proper kind of defaults to the Caucasian because we're talking, Harold restarted in Europe, Okay, um, but he's vested azure, so vested means the clothing is azure or blue, and so on. So, anyway, so there you get a few examples of human figures. Okay, so 
Now we get into beasts, and beasts is where things get a lot more interesting because beasts were used a lot in heraldry and period, and they're used a lot in SCA heraldry. So in most cases, when I talk about beasts, I'm talking about having four, le four legs and no wings. If you add wings to a four-limbed creature or a fishtail to a creature, they become a monster, okay? Something not found in nature, okay? So um, there are, of course, a few exceptions, but not a whole lot. Now, beasts have a large number of postures, and we're going to take a look at a bunch of them. Um, and we're going to start with the lion, because the lion is the one that is the most commonly used in British heraldry. That doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of others, but lions are used a lot in British heraldry. So the first thing we need to look at, though, are the postures themselves. And we're using the lion as the example, because that's the one that Fox Davies uses to show you pretty much every, almost everything. Um, there is a bit, um, notice in the, the top paragraph here, I talk about, we'll talk about the philosophy of heraldic design in the last lesson. The last lesson is going to be about putting everything together. So you need to know a little bit more about, you know, philosophy of design. Um, but we do need to know something about the postures themselves. Um, so the first posture is rampant. When you talk about a lion, this is the default posture for a lion. It is in a fighting position. Notice that when you look at it, that one foot is on the ground. Everything else is up off the ground. And it may look a, like, look a little unstable, but in the medieval mindset, this is a very stable thing. This, this creature is very stable. He's not going anywhere. He's just there, and he's in that position. Okay? Now, the next one is salient, which is leaping or springing. The big difference between salient and rampant is the hind paws. Notice that the, la the hind paws are both effectively on the ground. I, I put it on the ground in quotes up here because there is no actual ground in the, in the field. But the idea is that both paws are down. The both of the hind paws are down and the front paws are up, okay? Combatant is two lions, in this case, facing each other rampant or fighting, which is why the term combatant. And we'll come back to that one again in, in a little bit. Now, the other aspect of this is that you can turn the lion the other direction. So the, the image that just showed up, which is the third image at the bottom of the screen, is facing the other direction. By default, if you say a lion rampant, it's facing to the dexter side of the, of the shield. Okay, and dexter is kind of fun. We talked about this in the first class where dexter is right and sinister is left, except that's by the person who's carrying the shield, right? So when you're looking at it, think of it as stage left and stage right. So Dexter is on the, what you, when you're looking at it, is on your left, okay? But the lion faces that direction by default. So if I simply say a lion, a, a lion or a lion rampant, it's facing to the Dexter. If I want a lion facing the other direction, it's too sinister, or it's conterney or conterne, different ways of spelling the same thing. Um, so, and then the image there is quite, is exactly a flip of, of image 303. I literally just went in, copied it, put it into into an editor, and went flip it, and that's all I did. You know. Um, now the terms uh, is too sinister, conterney, or conterne um, can be used pretty much for all beasts creatures, monsters, fish, um, and a lot of inanimate charges. There are so when we get to the in, inanimate charges, there's the default position for an arrow, you know, that kind of thing. And contourney would be turning it the other direction. So now um, looking at other postures for for beasts, and we're, again we're using lions, um, we have passant, which is walking, three legs on the ground. Okay. Um, statant, all four legs are on the ground. Sayant, which is sitting, and the, the, the position of the tail is kind of an interesting one because sometimes Fox Davies, when he draws these, the tail goes between the legs and sometimes it's just up like it is on the lion statement and the lion passant there. Um, there is sayant erect, which is very similar to sayant. It's sitting, but it's sitting up, okay? And when, I, when my cats do what I call them meerkats, but, you know, that's basically what we're looking at is they're sitting up, right? Um, and there's cushion, which is lying down. And then there's dormant, which is 
effectively asleep. And dormant kind of makes sense for that, right? Lying down, head on their paws as if they're asleep. So now with tincture, um, again, uh, as I mentioned before, you can do a lot of interesting things with the colors of the beat of a beast or any charge. Um, is you can use field divisions, you can use furs, you can use field treatments, you can even use samays on the beast itself, which would be the color. You could have a lion ermine, which sounds a little weird because the ermine itself is a creature, right? But it would be the fur ermine, and that would mean it would be white with black ermine spots on it, okay? So interesting little thing that you can do there. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. It's an SCA example because there aren't a lot of pictures except going into Neubecker, which gets a little weird. It's a German continental. Um, but if you look at the image, you'll see that the lion is Barry or Bari. And it's just a series of bars. Um, so it's a Argent, a lion, Bari, or an Vert. And what that means is it's literally divided as if you were doing the field division Bari. Um, no, I don't think that uh, dormant is is, un, is not approvable. It's as far as I know, dormant is perfectly acceptable. Um, I haven't seen anything that said that it wasn't. Um, it's a good question, though. Um, but yeah, to the best of my knowledge, dormant is perfectly fine. Um, so it's just a question that popped up. So anyway, so uh, a lion bari or in vert. And the nice, interesting thing about this is notice that half of it is or, but you're using a white field. This is a way to get around um, the tincture issue, right? Color on color, metal on metal. Normally, you couldn't put an or lion on an argent field. But because it's only half or and it's half a color, you can get away with it. Okay, 50-50. There's actually this weird little rule that says 50%. Okay. Um, so this allowed Elaine to actually do this um, for her arms as, you know, it's or and Barrett, even though, and even the top part of it is or, um, and, the, and the bottom part are or, um, because it's half and half, it's 50-50. Okay, so kind of a neat little trick. Um, and you can do, and, and this can be really fascinating. The interesting thing is it's not something you see a lot in British heraldry. You see it more in European continental heraldry. Um, you don't see it as much in the British heraldry. So if you look at a lot of British books on heraldry, you don't see a whole lot of this type of thing with animals. Okay, so let me come back to this slide. Okay, now when you're dealing with multiple creatures on the field for your device, um, when you have two, I'm going to be specifically looking at two for this one. Um, We'll look at some other stuff in the last lesson about multiple charges and so on. But um, when you have two, by default, if I state two lions, this is what you're going to see. Is this the image, the first image that's showing up here? Okay. They're facing the same direction. Okay. So that's the default. Now, if on the other hand, I decided to use combatants, which we saw in the previous slide as well, is two creatures fighting each other combatant and they are rampant and they are and, and so the rampant posture is facing each other and they are fighting okay now they don't actually see any blood you know and so on because this is heraldry and they don't actually move but um now the term combatant is supposed to be used only for predators however as you will see there are, are cases where combatant sometimes gets used for non-predators okay but by default um now, Fox Davies calls this two lions rampant combatant. The word rampant is kind of redundant here. Um, this could simply be two lions combatant, and that would work just fine. Okay. Now, respectant is two creatures that are non-predators, um, but they're in the same, but they're in the rampant posture, but they're facing each other. So, respectant would be two of them facing each other. Um, now, it's interesting is that the actual blazon for this used combatant. And that may be because the person who registered this really wanted them to be combatant. When I was doing, I did a search on respectant, and this is the first, one of the ones that came up. And so I just decided I could use that image, and there we go. This could easily have been blazoned as Azure Two Stags um, respectant. And that might have been needed to be combat or, or rampant respectant, but Two Stags um, um, and, and so on. But the idea is that respectant is normally what is used for um, non-predators, 
but sometimes, you know, the rules are kind of fluid sometimes. Okay. Now, the other one is when the two creatures are facing away from each other, they are endorsed. Okay. Now, the term endorsed has some interesting aspects because when we look at birds in the next lesson, we'll see that this also deals with wings, and it's kind of an interesting, you know. Um, and then uh, we'll also be looking at it again for uh, some other things. So a doors can also be used for um, um, multiple charges. So you can have, um, if you had two arrows with the arrowheads facing away from each other, they would be a doors because they're, the arrowheads are not facing each other. It's a little tricky and a little weird, but there you go. We don't need to worry about that too much. Like I state, don't worry about memorizing any of this. Okay. Yeah, the terms respected and endorsed can be used for creatures. They can be used for the heads of creatures. And again, as I know, it's sometimes for other charges. So anyway, but the idea here is that there are different things that you can do just within having multiple of a specific charge. Okay. Now, the other thing is head positions. When you place a lion onto a field, the head position follows the direction of the body by default. There's no term for that. You don't need a special term for that. It's what's assumed, okay? However, um, you can also have the lion facing out of the shield and looking at the, at the person looking at the device, okay? This is called gardened. So a lion rampant gardened, I show a lion passant gardened, a lion statant gardened, and a lion saint gardened erect. That one's a little weird. The, 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 normally you would put the head position last, so it should be a lion saint erect gardened. Sometimes the editors for Fox Davies got a couple things weird, and we'll see that in some of the later slides as well. Anyway, the other one is regardant, where the lion's head is facing the other direction from the body, so it's looking over its shoulder. Okay, so you'll see in image 286, a lion rampant regardant. It's looking over its shoulder the other direction. Okay, some people kind of like that. It's, it's an interesting way to deal with it. A lion passant regardant in image 298 and so on. So again, there's different ways to draw these creatures and there's not a huge amount of difference. If I were looking at conflict research, which is a whole other topic, and I had a lion rampant and a lion rampant regard. There's not a lot of difference between the two. So there might be a, a small difference, but you wouldn't have a major difference between the two. But it, it's, it's something that's going to be more based on what you want or what, if you're working with somebody on heraldry, what they want. Um, it's kind of an interesting way to look at these creatures. Okay. Yeah, the last item is a really interesting one. It's called a tricorporate lion. And this is a head that's gardened, so it's facing out of the shield, if you look at that carefully, and it's got three bodies. Okay, so it's kind of a weird one, but it's an interesting one. Um, you can do bicorporate, which would have two bodies. Basically, you would have the two bodies coming up from the bottom and coming up to one head um, by default. I don't know if you can do more than three, though. I think tricorporate is the usual. I mean, if you look at the way that fills the field, uh, trying to fit another body in there would be kind of tricky. Um, so I wouldn't even try, but there you go. It's a, it's a weird one, and you don't see it very often, okay? And we do have a couple of cases of, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember. Uh, there was a, a rabbit, I think, at one point where there, where you've got a tricorporate rabbit, but they're attached at the ears rather than at the head. So that's even weirder. So interesting things that you can do, okay? I, like I said, I can't show you every possible permutation. I'm just making sure I'm not skipping anything in my notes here, okay? Um, one thing to note about lions, about beast heads, notice that every one of the ones that Fox Davies draws, the tongue is sticking out. That's because it's supposed to look fierce. It's kind of like the Maori, if you're familiar with the Maori um, um, war dances and so on, where they do that big thing with the eyes and the tongue sticking out and all of that. They're trying to look fierce. And that's what's happening with the lion here is that they're, they're making the lion look fierce this way. Okay. So. And the last thing is on tails. Tails are kind of interesting because with um, you see this more with lions, but you do you can see it with some other creatures. Is that um, you can do it in some things with tails that you don't normally see. Um, for example, we have a lion rampant double cued, and the word cued is referring to the tail. A double obviously would mean two tails, right? So if you look at this one, you can see there's actually two tails coming out of the rear of the lion. 
You can also have a tail Q for, you can have, the, well, actually a lion Q for a Shea, which is a forked tail, okay? And if you look, you've got one tail coming out, but then it forks into two parts, okay? And so again, it's kind of an interesting little thing that you can do. And there's NAUD, which is the tail tied in a knot. Now, I've actually often wondered how come you don't see more cats with their tails tied in knots, but obviously you know, they don't actually work that way. But, um, and then there's the interesting one of a tail coward, which is the tail down between the hind legs. In this case, we have a, ta a lion rampant coward, okay? And so that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, you don't see it much because the medieval mindset dealt with the idea of um, cowardice being a bad thing, obviously. And so you don't see it much on people's armory because you don't want to be called a coward, right? And so you don't see this um, a lot in period armory. Um, it doesn't show up in a lot of other things either. Yeah, there are a whole lot of other attributes, and we're not going to try to get into every single one of them because it just gets a little crazy. But um, the idea is, and I pulled this out of a out of a book by by the author Stephen Fryer, and again, the resources will have all the details. But um, you'll see things like armed, and what that is used for is to define the tincture. So if you state that a lion, let's say, or armed ghouls would mean that all of its claws, its teeth, would all be red. Okay, so that would be was what armed would mean. Um, if you talk about, um, let's see, I'm looking for another one. A crime, if you're talking about some of them, the hair or the mane, you can state for a lion, if, for example, a lion or a crimed ghouls, which would mean it would have a red mane instead of the gold mane that you would normally expect. Um, inflamed, which means there's flames around the, around the creature. Um, Forche, talking about the tail, a forked tail. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff in here, orb, the color of the eyes. A lot of these don't actually get registered. They're not reg normally a part of the blazon anymore because they tend to be considered to be artistic license. Um, some of the early registrations, um, they're one of the early queens of the SCA had a unicorn pizzled a different color and its penis was a different color. And it was very important to her, so it's actually in her blazon. That's not registered anymore. You can't register the term pizzled anymore. So there you go. Okay. So anyway, there's a whole lot of those and don't worry too much. Again, you don't have to worry about memorizing all that. It's, it's huge. Um, so now that we've looked at lions and we've looked at postures in general, we're going to look at other creatures. Okay. So we're going to start off. We were already looking at cats. So let's look at some more cats. So we have what is called a natural tiger or a Bengal tiger. Okay. And there's a real good reason for that, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit, but there's a monster version of a tiger, okay, which is actually when you talk about a tiger in heraldry, that's what it defaults to is the monster, okay? And uh, so when we want to, if you want to use a natural tiger, you have to define it as a natural tiger or as a Bengal tiger, okay? Now, the leopard is very common in British heraldry. It's very similar to a lion. Um, it has no mane and it has spots. By default, the spots are going to be black. And again, you could define those as a separate color if you wanted to. Um, we have what is called a catamount, a catamountant, or a wildcat. And as I was digging through a lot of things, I found that it's sometimes called a natural panther. And again, we'll talk about the panther as a monster when we get to monsters. Okay. Um, there is no real explanation in any of the books that I found between a catamount and a house cat, but if you look at the appearance of them, house cats show up a lot more in SCA heraldry than they do in modern in, in period heraldry, but they do show up occasionally in period heraldry. Okay, and all of these can use all the standard postures that I showed you before. Okay, so. The lynx, which is the last one, um, is defined by Bruce, and that's Bruce Draconarius. We'll, you'll see his name pop up a lot in these lessons. Um, is a spotted lion, or a spotted feline, sorry, with tufted ears, prominent side whiskers, and a subtail. Basically, if you know what a lynx looks like, that's pretty much defines it. Okay. So now let's move on to the canine side of things. 
Bulls are fairly common in period armory, but they also show up, well, they show up a lot in SCA armory because, well, we've got a lot of people who consider themselves to be lone wolves or whatever, right? And I'm not trying to say that as a bad thing. It's just, you know, people have their identities. Um, there is a, an interesting thing here. If you look at these, we've got a wolf rampant, a wolf salient, a wolf passant, all the standard postures. Then we've got a new posture, except Fox Davies did something weird with this one. It's not really a, a wolf courant. Courant is supposed to be running, which means all four legs are off the ground. I do not recommend that you try to use this particular version of Courant. It would likely get returned by the College of Arms. Um, I will show you what Courant looks like more, more appropriately in another slide, but this is more halfway between salient and passing. It's a really weird posture. I put it up here because it was in Fox Davies and it was kind of interesting, but it's not really what a, what, what Courant looks like. Okay. Wolves don't seem to have a default posture, where with a lion, if I state a lion and I don't give a posture, it's going to be assumed to be rampant. Wolves don't have that, okay? And there's no specific po uh, a proper definition either. And that's because there are different types of wolves, timber wolves and dire wolves and all kinds, you know, there's all kinds of different wolves out there. Okay, now foxes are not really all that common in period heraldry. Um, but they, you do see them in support as supporters and crests. If you look at full, you know, um, kind of lost the term, the full displays of, of, of some of the later armory and so on, where they have uh, you know, all the stuff with, with, you know, banners and all helms and all of that on the arms. Um, but anyway, uh, they don't have a default posture. But within SCA armory, they are defined as proper with red black socks, white chest, and a white tip. And I used that earlier as a good example. Um, this is treated overall as a color when you're dealing with the rule of teachers. So you couldn't put a fox proper on a black field, okay? Because it is mostly red, okay? So now when we look at, at canines as well, we need to look at the term dog, okay? Within heraldry, especially in period heraldry, um, there's only really a couple of dogs that are really used much. So um, Fox Davies gives examples of Talbots and Greyhounds, and a Talbot is the default dog. So if you simply state, you know, some field color, a dog, then it's going to be a Talbot. Okay, that's just the default. Um, any other breed of dog has to be specified. Okay. Uh, one common dog breed in the period armory is a greyhound, and for that, you would simply call it a greyhound. You don't need to state a dog greyhound or a greyhound dog. It would just be a greyhound. Um, notice the uh, the way that greyhound, the greyhound current is shown in image 373. It's the last image at the bottom there. Um, that's an actual correct version of current. All four legs are off the ground, okay? And so it's all, it's running, okay? Now, there's no default posture or tincture, and there's no real definition for proper if you just simply stated dog proper. However, if you have a specific breed of dog, and the SCA does recognize various breeds of dogs, um, and I'm not even going to try to get into all the various breeds that are recognized, um, you may be able to specify a specific breed of dog as proper. Okay, so if you were to use a, a husky, for example, huskies are very specifically colored um, and so on. So now, moving on to other types of creatures, so beasts. So um, there's no default posture for a bear, so you always have to define your posture. If it's defined as proper, the bear is going to be brown. Now, if you wanted to have a polar bear, you would have to define a polar bear proper, which would mean white. Or you could simply call it a, a bear argent, and it would be fine, right? Um, and so the postures, and again, I'm giving you different examples of postures just to show you they all use a lot of the same postures here, okay? Now, the boar, again, no default posture, and again, but the default proper color for a boar is brown. I bring up the boar because while not as commonly used in the SCA, they were actually a fierce creature in period, and so they were used a lot to show somebody who was very fierce, or, or thought they were very fierce. You know. So um, the horse, again, no no default posture, no default proper. 
Um, and again, we see a horse current in the last image there. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of reinforce that a, a, a beast that's running or current has all four um, legs off and around. Okay, now beasts, bulls. Bulls, again, there's no default posture or color. Um, so proper, there's no default color. So you would have to define the, board, the bull and all the way across the board. You know, bull rampant, ghouls, or whatever you were doing. Um, sheep, goat, sheep, goat, and ram. There is no default posture for these. These are kind of interesting because out of Fox Davies, the sheep that are given are very specific. He gives us the uh, the paschal lamb, which is actually a symbol, a religious symbol, okay? And it's used for, let me come over to that slide. Um, Friar actually says very clearly it's a Christian symbol. A lamb passant with a halo or nimbus behind the head, holding a staff at the upper end of which both are a cross and a white pennon charged with a red cross. Okay. Um, and a, let's see, the nimbus or halo are often themselves charged with a cross forming throughout, which doesn't show up in this one. Um, he doesn't explain the symbolism us much, but it's really, it's, it's another one of those religious symbols and so it doesn't it doesn't show up a whole lot in SCA armory but it is something you could do if you really wanted it. Um, we also see the fleece and as it's shown this is from the Order of the Golden Fleece which is a British high honor um, but you can actually use that. Um, we had somebody who, several years ago who registered a fleece that looked very much like this okay with the belt with the the, the little ring on top and all that. Um, so anyway, so that's that. I just wanted to mention that. Um, you can actually have sheep. I just, Fox Davies didn't have any examples of sheep by themselves, just regular old sheep. Um, now we also have a goat. Um, and again, one of those things where the editor got things wrong. Um, he lists a goat passant, which is actually a goat rampant. And the goat that's uh, over on the uh, 402 that's a goat that's, that's listed as a goat rampant is actually a goat passant. It's so weird the number of things that slipped past the editors when Fox Davies book was being published. And that may have been corrected in the version after I got my copy. I have no idea. So, um, but anyway, um, so those are goats and you have rams and rams look a lot like goats except the horns curl and they tend to look more like, you know, the wool looks more like sheep. Okay. Now it should be noted that a goat rampant or a ram rampant can also be called climate, meaning that they're climbing. As if you, you know anything about goats and rams, especially goats, but they climb. They climb all the time. Okay. So the term climate means is, is can be used instead of rampant. Okay. It's just one of those weird little terms. For whatever reason, it's there. Okay. Now, beast, deer, stag, and hind. So I mentioned here, um, I'm not doing these on a separate page because they're my personal totem and anybody that knows me, I have two stag's heads on my arms and all that. Um, but they have, they use the standard postures for appearance, but there are different terms for some of them. Okay. So another thing to note is a male deer can be called a stag, a buck, or a heart, spelled H-A-R-T. Um, this is because of what is called canting arms. And canting is a pun within the heraldry off of the name of the person that's registering the arms. So there's a joke that's been around for many years. That's an old heraldic joke. Heralds don't pun, they can't. It's a really dumb joke in a lot of ways, but there you go. Okay, so um, now, um, Basically, and I also have a next, I have a definition in here about about canting that's that's on the notes for the slide. So if you if you pull those down, you'll see that. But anyway, um, but I give an example of some of a, if somebody who's a member of a family called Buckminster wanted to have a stag on their arms, they would use the term buck instead of a stag, and it would be the same thing. It's exactly the same charge. Okay. Um, when blazoned as proper, um, the color is brown and the antlers are generally a light yellow brown, kind of a goldish, yellowish, whatever. Um, for the rule of contrast, this would be color. So you couldn't put this again on a dark field. Okay. So the images here are just showing the ones that are, are mostly showing the ones that are different. So a staggered deer that is salient 
is blazoned in heraldry as springy. Okay. A stag or deer that is passant is blazoned as trippant. A stag or deer that is stayed and gardened, notice the head position is facing out, is called a stag at gaze. Okay, there is no specific term for simply statement, so you could have a stag statement, but if you have a stag that's state and gardened, it would be a stag at gaze. Um, a stag current doesn't have a different term, but once again, I'm kind of reinforcing all four legs off the ground. Um, and a stag or deer that is cushioned is lodged, which means it's lying down and you know comfortable on the ground. Um, the posture of the hind on the last image should actually be listed for whatever reason. Again, the editors left some things out or something. I don't know. But the hind that is shown is stained. And the difference between a hind is that if, if that's a female deer, it doesn't have antlers. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a bunch of other animals. I'm, not, I'm going to break it down. I used to have these all on one slide when I was starting out. And I decided that was way too much. So I broke it out into multiple slides. So. An elephant. So in heraldry, one of the defaults, especially in period armory, is for an elephant to be carrying a castle on its back because they were used in war, right? So a little weird, but there you go. Um, if they're proper, the color is gray with virgin tusks. Um, if you go out to Bruce's website, you look up elephant, he will show you one that looks a little different, looks radically different in some ways. It's, a, it's based off of a period drawing of an elephant, um, and it doesn't have a castle on its back. So you might actually have to define for an elephant the castle. You might not. I'm not real sure. There's rabbit, hare, and coney. There doesn't seem to be any difference, but um, as far as, you know, just the, the, the display of the, of the, of the rabbit, but for some people, whether it's a rabbit versus a hare versus a coney might actually be important. So you can use any of those terms. Proper is defined as brown, but of course you can have them any other color that you want to. So if you don't want it to be proper, you could call it or you could call it ghouls, whatever. Um, the squirrel is kind of fun. By default, a squirrel in heraldry is uses the British squirrel, which has the pointed ears. So if you look at the image 407 down here, it's got the, the pointed ears on it. Um, the default posture for a squirrel is say and erect. So you don't have to define the squirrel as being say and erect. Okay, you can just simply state a squirrel. Okay. Um, and often, but not always, they have an acorn between the paws. Okay. Now, I showed you, I brought up the arms of Edith uh, of Swains, Swainsdale, who's the Matins Herald for the Kingdom of the West. Um, but anyway, because she has one that has a, has the uh, acorn, and she does, the, the, you don't actually have to put maintaining an acorn unless it's really important to you that the squirrel have the acorn, because that allows a, a heraldic artist or a scribe to draw it with or without. But since hers actually says maintaining an acorn, it's not correct if the acorn isn't there. That kind of makes sense. Okay, so, but that's kind of an interesting aspect of heraldry is there are these weird little rules about some things where there are certain assumptions that are made, but they don't always follow. So, you know, it makes things fun. Um, there's an ape, there's not a lot said. I was weird. I was looking through Fox Davies. He doesn't really say much about an ape. Um, it's typically shown with the, uh, the belt and the collar or the belt or collar around the waist and with a chain because they were used as pets and... Yeah, and so on. Uh, people brought them back from their travels during the pil their pilgrimages and so on. Um, so now a few more from Fox Davies. There's the Brock or Badger. Um, it has a default posture of, of statent and honestly a badger rampant would look a little weird because of the short legs. Okay. <laughs> they look a little strange. Like little tiny legs, kind of like a T-Rex or something. Right? Um, there's no proper coloration. Um, I also used uh, for the otter, because otters, especially out here in California, are really popular. Um, an otter is sometimes shown as maintaining a fish in its mouth. Um, it's not required, though. So again, so the default from Fox Davies doesn't have the fish in the mouth. Um, but the one that's colored is the arms of uh, Asa Torvald's daughter, um, and it has 
simply blazoned as an otter statement. However, she prefers it with a fish in the mouth. Okay, so if you look, you'll see that there's a fish in the mouth of the otter there. And that's because that's how she likes to have her arms displayed. But she didn't insist on it being in the blazon. She could have if she wanted to. Okay. So, now, an urchin or a hedgehog, um, the default posture is statent. It's also, the proper is defined as brown with a little bit of white. Um, let's see here. I have to move this a little bit. White face. Um, but again, for the, for the purpose of the rule of tincture, these are going to be brown. Okay. Uh, the second image I just put in there from Bruce's website because he, he draws a little differently than Fox Davies does. Um, and the bat. Bats tend to be displayed because any other posture for a bat is going to be really confusing. Okay. And bats show up here rather than under birds because even in the medieval times, bats were considered beasts rather than birds. So, okay. Now, a few more. Um, when I was look, doing all my research and trying to bring up some good examples and so on, I noticed that Bruce had some things, had some creatures that, uh, that Fox Davies did. And so I grabbed some of those and put them up in here as well. So we have a camel. Um, and camels became fairly well known in British heraldry because, of course, again, people going off to pilgrimages or the Crusades or whatever, they saw camels. Um, the de default camel is single hump, so if you simply state a camel, um, it's going to be a dromedary. If you want a Bactrian camel, you have to specifically blazon it as a Bactrian camel, because that will give you the two humps. Um, it can be shown as saddled and bridled, which means it has the tackle and so on that are used for riding the camel. Or it can be laden with goods, so it can actually have like you know stuff on its back, backpack of packs and so on. Um, so, yeah, the beaver is an interesting one. Okay, now let me bring this one up because I, I, I actually really find this one kind of amusing. Okay, um, it's drawn in heraldic art, mostly as seen in nature, except look at the face. Notice those weird fangs coming up from the lower jaw. It's a little weird. Okay, um, it's not really considered to be a monster, though. Um, there are some interesting notes that I have, um, and these are based off of. Um, a book by T.H. White. And if you're familiar with T.H. White, he's mostly known for The Once and Future King. Um, however, he translated a 12th century bestiary from Latin into English. Okay, And his translation describes the beaver as um, it was hunted for its testicles because the testicles were used for medicine. So a beaver that is smart, when it realizes it's being hunted, will chew off its tentacle, testicles and leave them behind and run and hide. Okay, a little weird, okay? But even more fun is if somebody tries to hunt that same beaver again, the beaver will raise its hind leg and show that it has no testicles, assuming that the hunter will then leave it alone. Some of the mythology from the creatures from the 12th century are a little weird, okay? So, uh, but anyway, so there you go, it's weird stuff. I'd actually kind of recommend that book, though. It's kind of a fun read. It's um, it's uh, called The Book of Beasts, and it's translated by T.H. White. And again, it's in the, the, the resources used. Now, the ermine um, was used periodically in heraldry. Um, the fur itself was used more, but, um, but if it's blazoned as proper, it's shown in the winter colors for an ermine, which is white with a black tail. These are sometimes also called a stoat or a weasel, but if you used a stoat or a weasel, they would have different coloration. Um, so the hyena is distinguished by the ridge of hair down its back and a lion-like tail. Now I note that this could have been put in with the canines and dogs, but it was I wasn't finding it in Fox Davies, which is where I pulled most of those images. And it's kind of off a little bit from you know the appearance of it. Um, but hyenas tend to be drawn pretty close to natural. Um, so now um, a few more images. There's the mole. And a mole, because of just you, you see them from above when you look at a mole, right? Um, tend to be displayed as turgent fesswise. And the term turgent is seen from above. So you're looking down on it. Okay. And horizontal for fesswise. So 
The mongoose, which is famed for its ability to kill serpents, there's no default posture. Um, the tail could be up or down. That's a style that's an artistic license issue. Um, the mouse, uh, for the purpose of heraldry, especially when you're dealing with registrations and so on, mice and rats are close enough in appearance that they tend to be the same, but anybody who's really dealt with either one of them knows that they look a lot different from each other. Um, but there you are. Um, there's no default posture or proper tincture for them because, again, you know, mouse can be gray, it can be white, it can be brown, same for rats. Um, the rhinoceros is statent by default. Um, and I have a, I, I put together a note because I was just, you know, I was feeling silly when I put this note together. But um, I, I, I note just an observation, don't try this at home. One could argue that, our, that a rhinoceros's fighting posture is pretty much statent, in which case, this could be rampant for a rhinoceros, except that if somebody is reading a blazon and they saw a, ra a rhinoceros rampant, they would draw it in a standard rampant posture, right? They wouldn't draw it this way because there are standard postures. But anyway, so I know you don't do that at home because the heralds would kind of look at you funny. Um, so anyway, now I do want to mention, because I mentioned it earlier, there are some monsters that, or some, some beasts that have monster variations. I'm just going to give you a few examples here um, just to show you why there's a difference between the natural monster, a natural beast and the monster version of a beast. Okay. So the first one is an antelope. And weirdly enough, there's a heraldic antelope, which if you talk about an antelope in heraldry, it's going to tend to be simply, be simply called an antelope. Um, looks like this. Okay, I did not find any examples in any of my books of a natural antelope. Now, I, then I, I went looking in the SCA registry, and there's only like two that are the antelope itself, and there's one that's an antelope's head. Okay, and they're also stuff that I don't have images of. So, but anyway, there are some slightly different depictions, but this is kind of an interesting because if you look at the nose of that antelope, it's got this weird little tusk hanging off of it because it makes it into more of a monster, right? So, so the tiger, I give you an example of a standard Bengal tiger, but then I show you a heraldic tiger or a tiger spelled T-Y-G-R-E, which is, if you simply state a tiger spelled that way, it's known to be the heraldic tiger, okay? A body much like a natural tiger, a lion's tufted tail, and the head, which is more wolf-like than anything else, but it also has that weird tusk hanging off the nose, okay? So it's kind of an odd creature. There's a sea lion, and obviously if you look at these, they're radically different from each other. Um, a natural sea lion, I put this in even though it really ought to be in another slide, but another uh, class, but, um, but I wanted to put these in here as I'm talking about the difference. So what we see here is a sea lion in its natural form. This could be a natural sea lion or simply a seal. Um, uh, and then you also have the monster, the sea lion, which is half lion and half fish. Okay. So we'll talk about, when we get to monsters, we'll talk about the, you know, doing, attack, attacking a, a tail on, the, on the just about anything. You can have a sea something. Um, the ibex is related to the antelope. Um, however, it's also kind of related to the mountain goat. So if you look at the first image here for the ibex, you've got a mountain goat. That's a natural Ibex. The heraldic ibex has serrated horns, a tusk on the nose, fangs. Uh, again, it's turned into a monster. Um, and Bruce goes into some detail as to why and all of that. If you go out to his website, there's a lot of detail on there as to why the ibex turned out the way it did. And it's supposed to be related to another monster, which we're not getting into and so on. But anyway, just, just to give you an idea of why Sometimes you have to define something as a natural beast. If you want to use the natural version of a beast, you have to define it as such. Otherwise, you're going to get something really different. Okay. So, um, so there's just there's always more when we're talking about beasts. So this is an important aspect of this, as I mentioned in the, one of the earliest slides, is that I can't possibly give you every single possible beast and every permutation of every beast, or we'd be here all night. And I know that some of us have got other things to do, right? Um, but anyway, um, so I just want to make sure you're aware. There's a lot more out there. 
Um, I do mention uh, Neubecker, if you're interested in German or continental heraldry, Neubecker shows different examples of, of creatures that look different. It's the drawing style in a lot of cases. It's a very useful tool just to get a feel for some of what's out there. Okay, and I'll be, I'll be referencing Neubecker periodically as we look at other types of creatures and stuff as well. Um, and I also mentioned again, Bruce Drakenarius's Pictorial Dictionary of Heraldry, which is a very useful website. So the last part of this, we're going to take a look at beast parts. And we're going to start off with human parts because we started off with humans in this lesson. So now, when we look at heads, we're going to look at other parts as well. Um, heraldry often uses for um, a lot of parts. And with humans, you actually see fewer full figure humans and more an arm or a leg or a foot or a hand or whatever. Okay, um, so human heads, these are all pretty straightforward if you look at them. A savage's head, if we looked at the savage earlier, um, and so on, it's got leaves and all that. The blackamoor, a Saracen's head, although these days we probably wouldn't use the term blackamoor. It's an old term that can be offensive to some people. We don't want to go there. But, um, a woman's head and bust, just to make sure it's a woman, in, in case you weren't sure, right, um, and so on. Um, with human, with the full, as as with the full human figures, as I mentioned when we looked at those, you have to define the skin color based off of you know uh, light skin, dark skin, and so on. Um, and then you can also you have to de determine the color of the hair, which would be crime. So the woman might be, if she was a redhead, she might be art, uh, light skinned, uh, woman's head and bust, crimed ghouls. Which would give you the red hair for the the redhead. Okay, so now the other parts are arms and hands are used a lot, um, and we'll take a look at legs as well. But that's going to be on another slide. Um, so when you're looking at um, the arms and and so on, a human arm is simply an arm. So if you see the term arm in a blazon, it's going to be a human arm. It's not going to be the foreleg of a lion. Okay. Um, by default, they tend to be embowed a bit, so they're bent at the elbow. Um, and again, by default, it's going to be the right arm, the dexter arm. But in this case, it's the dexter arm of the person carrying the shield, okay, as opposed to the person viewing the shield. Right? Now, um, the term, the word embowed is, is assumed unless you state otherwise. Um, if you have an arm fest-wise, the fist is going to be in dexter, so it's going to be on the left side of the device, okay? Um, arms can be cooped or cubit. And we'll take a look at the term cubit, uh, cooped in more detail in just a little bit, but, um, but it's cut off. A cubit arm is cut off below the elbow. So it's literally, and if, if you can remember, you know, uh, um, the Bill Cosby routine with Noah, and he talks about, right, what's a cubit? That's what a cubit is. Okay, it's from below the arm, below the elbow, to the end of the of the fingers. Okay, um, two arms can be interlaced. They can also be counter embowed, so they're facing each other. They're facing as it were. Um, you can see arms in armor, and the first one you will see that the hand does not have a gauntlet on it. The second one does. Okay, so you have to define if there's going to be a gauntlet there. Now, when you look at hands um, by themselves, you have a dexter hand and a sinister hand. And by default, a hand is a palmy, which means palm front. Okay, so you're seeing the palm of the hand. If you look at the hand from the back of the hand, I, I mentioned it in, in here, it's called a versant. I don't have any pictures of it because it's pretty unusual. Okay, but that would be the back of the hand rather than the palm. Um, hands may be in gauntlets, but again, once you put them in gauntlets, and if it's just the hand, it's a gauntlet. Okay, you don't really see anything that shows you the, the hand itself. Um, and the last image is a hand in benediction, a priest doing his little, you know, thing, domini, domini, and all that. Um, and again, there are a lot of options with arms and hands and so on. You can have an arm or a hand holding something. Uh, commonly, you will see a hand holding a goblet or a hand holding a sword. Um, an arm issuant from the side of a field, and again, the hand from that could be holding a sword. There's a lot of different things that you can do. So again, I'm not showing you every possible permutation. 
I'm just trying to give you a feel for what can be done. Okay, so legs and feet. There aren't a lot of examples. So again, I went out to Bruce's website because he put through together some examples. Um, and again, if the tincture is proper, you have to define the, the color like you would otherwise. Um, a leg tends to be shown um, up, in, up including the thigh. You know, I, I forgot to mention, although I think it was on the slide, that um, if they are vested means they're wearing clothes, you can actually define, you have to define the color of the clothes as well. Um, by default, it's going to be the right leg, the dexter leg. Um, a human foot um, is detached at the ankle. And let's see, you can also do things like three armored legs in triskelion. A triskelion is a very specific charge, but you can also do things like three armored legs in triskelion. And actually, uh, one of our early kings of the, S of the West Kingdom, uh, Douglas Longshanks, uses um, three armored legs in triskelion. I didn't think to hunt that coat of arms down, but anyway, um, so there you go. Now, you can also use skeletons, okay? So I mentioned you can use internal parts of humans, specifically skeletons. I mentioned hearts. We'll get to that in another lesson. Um, they're perfectly acceptable. Most of these images are from Bruce's website. First up is a human skeleton, plain, straightforward, Full human figure, state and defronty, just like most humans are shown as state and defronty. Okay. Um, a bone, if you simply state a bone, is going to be either a human thigh bone or the arm bone. And the default posture is going to be pale wise, meaning it's vertical. Okay, you could have it fess wise, you would have to state fess wise. Um, you can use rib bones, but only in pairs. That's an interesting one. Okay. They always issue from the sides of the, of the shield or the sides of the armory display. But they, uh, and Bruce mentions that there's usually three pairs or six rib bones by default. Um, you still have to emblazon the number of pairs. So you would number this as three pairs of rib bones, not six rib bones, okay? Now, a human skull, we see those a lot more in, in SCA heraldry than we do in period heraldry, but there are examples of them in period heraldry. Um, Human skull is acceptable. You also have what is called a death's head, which is a human skull without the lower jaw. Now, the example that I give you here is from a website, um, which I mentioned in one of the earlier lessons, that I recommend that you use very carefully. And that's because um, the, uh, what is it, the name? I always forget the name of the site. But anyway, um, it's a traceable heraldry site. Some things he gets right, some things he doesn't. Okay. And so you want to, if you want to use something from that site, you want to make sure you check it with a herald just to make sure, because some things are, are actually correct and some are. But anyway, this one, the death said that is actually correct. Okay. Now, an, an important aspect about skulls is if you're showing them, especially if they're showing this way, um, the field itself doesn't show, because if you have the back of the skull there, then you wouldn't see the field through the eyes, right? You would see the back of the skull. So it would be the same color as the rest of the skull. Now, if you wanted the cavities, if you wanted the eyes, the eye holes to be sable or something, you can probably define that as part of your blazon. But it's not really necessary in most cases, okay? Um, a human tooth can be used, pretty rare, but once in a while, you know. And again, it, by default, it's going to be a molar, and you're going to see the roots because that's part of how you would define that. I don't know why you would want to put a human tooth on a, on a device, but okay, you know, it's like, okay. Now, beast parts. So when we look at heads for beasts, this is where we get into some interesting stuff. Um, how the neck is shown is very important, okay? And we're going to take a look at that. Okay, so I've got a question. Let's see. Well, dentist, well, yeah. <laughs> I just kind of figure for most people, it's like, well, okay, you know, most people aren't going to use a <laughs> tooth, but I can see a dentist maybe wanting to use one, but okay. Um, so, when, but importantly with beast heads, how the neck is shown is very important, okay? So we're going to take a look at some of that. Ooh, let me come back to here. Okay, so the first thing, I give you several examples here. A lion's head coot, a boar's head coot, although um, it's interesting that, that Fox Davies calls a, boar's, a bear's head coot English. We're going to take a look at why he does that in a moment. But it's kind of weird because basically it's the same thing as a lion's head coot. 
Um, and I and it says here, and again, this is one of those editor issues, a stag's head erased. That's not erased, that's cooped. It's a straight line, okay? And it's a horizontal line. So the other way you can do cooped is cooped close, okay? This is a vertical line, and it's usually, if you were to take a, if you had, for example, a bearer that was sand and you did, and you just cut the head off, that would be what you get with a head cooped. If you had a bear that was passant and you cut the head off, the posture would be this one here in, in image 351. Okay, so and you again we have a boar's head and again a minor typo in this one a boar's head coupled, which is not correct. It's a minor typo there. Um, so erased is torn off. You have ragged edges. Now. Ragged edges sounds really gory, but most, for the most part, you don't tend to have blood hanging off of the, the ragged edges or anything like that, because that's just a little gross um, and, and so on. But it's actually, in a way, it's kind of elegant looking in a, for a lot of these. So again, erased. And then you have erased close, which is going the other direction. It's basically a vertical version of erased. Okay. So I do mention... Um, couple of issues, cooped and coupled and erased and cooped and all of that. So there's just some minor little things that ended up in the Fox Davies book. Just some odd little things. And the, the second version of a stag's head erased is from a, from a, the author Child, who's one of my favorites because I like her drawing style. And that's my preferred version of my stag's head. Um, and it's just a personal preference. Stag's heads are stag's heads as far as heraldry is concerned. The way you draw them is up to the artist, right? So anyway, so other parts um, for beast heads is normally you have to worry about the neck unless you're using a face or you're using kibosed, okay? So a lion's face is gardened and there's no neck, but you don't have to state that it's kibosed or that it has no neck. You simply say a lion's face, okay? A leopard's face, Jacinto Lee, this one has always just intrigued me as to where in the world somebody came up with the idea of shoving a fleur de lis through the head of a leopard. Because if you look at it, it's coming out the mouth and the top of the head. So it went through the head to do that, right? It's a little weird, but I've not found any explanation for it that makes any sense. Okay, so there you go. One of those weird things that somebody came up with while they were drawing and went, that's really cool. There you go, right? Um, this can be done to other creatures' heads. It's very rare. Most of the time, if you see a head, uh, Jacinta Lee, it's a leopard's face. Or, you know, but it is possible to do that. You could do a lion, a lion's face, Jacinta Lee, or whatever. Okay. So a stag's head kiboshed or kibosed. Um, Fox Davies tends to use kiboshed. The SCA tends to use kibosed. Instead, it's just a consistency issue because you'll see it in different spellings throughout various books. Um, a leopard's head erased in a fronty. So in this case, it actually has a neck, but it's facing out of the field. And it could also be gardened if you wanted to call it that. Um, but it's facing out, and it, but the neck is erased. So again, there's lots of different ways. You could also have the leopard's head cooped, and it would have, it would have some neck, but it would be cut off straight. Okay, rather than erased like it's shown here. So lots of different ways you can deal with just the head. Okay. So other parts that can be dealt with, antlers and horns. Now, it's interesting because Fox Davies is pretty thorough most of the time. But for whatever reason, he doesn't really talk about antlers and horns. I don't know why, but there you go. Um, so Parker does call note that a stag's attire, which is a single antler, and it's literally the side, if you're looking at a stag's head, it's got that rack hanging off of it. That rack, it's one half of it, okay? So the, so the attire would be the single horn. Um, the horns together, when they're affixed to a scalp, can be called a massacre, and the SCA uses the term massacre for that, okay? So... And again, I'm pulling these from Bruce's website because he had them there and they were they were useful. So this is a massacre. It's a two stags of tires attached to the part of the scalp. Okay. Um, a stags of tire from German heraldry, and this this is something that you're going to see out of like Neubecker, again the German and Continental heraldry. 
Um, and if you look, if you see me at an event where I'm wearing my one of my caps, one of them has got this version of the antlers on the sides of the cap. Um, by default, this is shown fess wise or in the direction of a fess or horizontal. Okay. A ram's horn. Um, this again is a German depiction. Um, and two ram's horns. Bruce notes that when they're in pairs, the, the horns curve away from each other. So if you have two ram's horns, they're going to curve away from each other. Okay. Now, limbs. Okay. Fox Davies, again, doesn't spend much time on this, even though they are very, they're definitely something that you can find in period heraldry. Okay. So we have the foreleg or the jam, or as Parker calls it, the jam with a G, different spellings of the same thing. Um, it's the forelimb of a beast for a lion. It's a jam de Leon, Leon. And in on tier, there's actually an award called the Jam de Leon, okay, which is literally just what it sounds like. It's the forearm of the lion. Um, the examples below, uh, the first one is uh, from Bruce's website. Um, it's, in a, it's a Jam de Leon erased bendwise. So the erased is the part down at the bottom down there where it was torn off of the lion, right? Um, the second image is an SCA badge. It's Fieldless, a lion's jam, erased Bari or Berry Argent and Sable. So once again, I'm just trying to show you again that you can do those weird little field divisions and things um, to all kinds of charges. So I'm just kind of throw those in randomly as we go. Um, paws. They're very similar to a jam, but they're cut off closer to the paw. Um, they can also be erased or cooped. This one is, uh, like, I can't find any real examples except one in Neubecker, which is a very confusing device. Um, it had two bear's paws attached to some weird other charge, and it looked very strange. So I decided to go with something that was obviously a bear's paw. Now, this bear's paw is an SCA um, badge as well. Um, it's a bear's paw erased, which again, if you look at the bottom, it's jagged. Normally, you will see like three major parts to an erased, but sometimes you can do it. There's lots of different ways you can do erased, and so this just kind of works for this individual. Um, a palmy, so it's showing you the palm, okay, rather than the other way around. Again, if you were to turn that over, it would be a versant rather than a palmy, okay. Um, so, now, paw prints. You find, basically, you really don't see a lot of paw prints, if any, in period armory. They're really something that's used more in SCA armory, and you will see, if you look at prints, you'll see cat paw prints, bear paw prints, wolf paw prints. Okay, let's see here. Wow, I don't know where um, the guy who does the tra traceable art website got that from. As far as I know, dormant is still perfectly acceptable. So that's the question. Miriam was, was obviously was doing some research while we we're doing stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know where he got that from. Um, as far as I know, dormant is still okay. Uh, I, I can look um, out on the SCA's College of Arms site. But as far as I know, it's acceptable. It's always possible I missed something. Um, so paw prints. So, anyway, so again, paw prints. Now, the big problem with paw prints is because there's no examples that people can find in period armory, these are considered to be a step from core practice. And we'll talk about that again in the last lesson. But um, you can only have one step from, from core practice in a coat of arms. You can't have two. So if you had another item that was considered to be a step from core practice, that would be returned to you because we can't register that. Um, so anyway, and you, can, you would usually want to specify the type of paw print. A wolf's paw print is going to look different from a bear, from a cat, from a, you know, whatever. So, but paw prints are acceptable within SCA armory. Now, tails. Um, tails can be used, and again, all those different variations on tails I showed you for a lion. Um, you could do a, a, a lion's tail uh, Q forche um, or a lion's tail noun um, if you wanted to. Um, by default, a lion's tail is shown up, and a fox's tail is often is typically shown down. Now, why? It's because of just the nature of the way the charges are usually shown. It's just one of those weirdnesses of, you know, one of those weird little inconsistencies in heraldry. Okay, 
So that was everything I wanted to talk about for this lesson. That's kind of weird. It just feels like that went by really fast. Except to guess maybe it didn't. I don't know. I guess it didn't go by as fast as I thought it did. Okay. Um, so do you have any questions that we about things that we looked at? I realize that was a lot. Again, don't don't worry if you don't you know remember everything. But anything? Okay. Let's see here. Chat. Ah, thank you, Crystal. So I'm trying. I'm trying to cover a lot of material, but I know that it can get a little confusing and a little overwhelming. So I'm trying to not do too much. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, anything? Any questions? All making mostly making sense. Again, don't worry about memorizing. It'll take you a while. The more you do it, the more you work with heraldry. If you're somebody who's interested in being a herald or being a scribe or whatever, the more you work with it, the more when you see a term, you'll go, you'll, some of them will click in your head and you'll know exactly what you're looking at. And there will always be something where you have to look it up. There's always going to be something, no matter how often you do this. Like I've been doing this for over 40 years and League has been doing it even longer and he's still looking things up. Okay. So don't worry if, if you don't, if you, if you feel like there's a, there's way too much, none of us have this memorized. <laughs> okay, so um, the next lesson in two weeks, we're going to cover a lot of material here. A dragon is considered to be a monster, definitely, and that's going to be in the lesson after the next one. It's going to be in part five. But yeah, we will be definitely looking at dragons, though, because they are important, at least to SCA people, but yeah. But they were actually used. They were used mostly in period for um, compartments for display. But but they were occasionally used. Yeah, you know, yeah. Crystal Leak is pointing out sometimes people are afraid to try and blazon when talking to a herald. It's okay to try and get it wrong. Um, honestly, trust me. If you don't know the word, don't worry about it. If you can't remember Azure is blue, you can say blue, and we'll understand exactly what you're talking about. If you if, if you're not sure how to describe something, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. If you, but if you have some terms and you're not sure of that one thing, that's okay. We're you know we're people. We understand. We're well willing to talk to you and help you. Um, so um, so like I say, the next lesson: birds, fish, insects, reptiles, trees, plants, and flowers. A lot of material. You bet. Okay, so that's next. And just real quick, um, so real uh, adding wings or other physical concerns um, will have specific terminology. So when we get to birds, we're going to have different postures for the birds because they just aren't going to fit into the, the four-legged creatures. And the same for fish. They don't fit into four-legged creatures. Okay, some of the reptiles do, but only a few of them. And of course, trees and plants don't really have postures. They're just there, right? So, okay. So just a real quick, there's a lot here in the resources used. Um, so there's a, like I state, I'm always looking stuff up. I've got several books on my shelf. I go out to the web periodically. I go out to Bruce's site a lot. So at the very top here, there's the pictorial dictionary. There's a lot of material. So feel free. Um, to look at that. And again, I'm going to have the notes up online fairly shortly, and I'll put a link on the Facebook um, event. I'll, I'll put a link out to where the, the notes and stuff are. And once uh, this, the uh, video has been processed um, and put up on the West Kingdom YouTube site, Sarah will put the link up for that, and I'll make sure it's also available okay, in various places. So um, thank you for hanging in there. This lesson actually went a little longer than I thought it would, but that's going to happen sometimes. Um, and this is a fairly complex topic. So let me turn off the screen sharing. Stop the share. Okay, and Sarah, if you want to, you can turn off the, um, the recording, and we can just chat if people have things that they want to chat about. And you can turn your microphones, turn your microphones on if you want. So I know Crystal has been working with a lot of this because she does a lot of scribal work 